Blessing, the rains have come, and we are excited as we get ready for Emmanuel Israel's 10-year celebration. Imagine, 2014, April 5th, 2014 was our first Shabbat, and um, uh, it's hard to believe that 10 years have passed. But may the Lord give us another 10 years. Amen. Hallelujah. <laughs> but it's amazing how time flies. And I'm so grateful because I've been looking forward to putting together a video presentation of our last 10 years. And how do you consolidate 10 years into um, a few minutes? Few minutes. It has to go pretty rapidly, but I assure you that we will not have commercial interruptions <laughs> in that presentation. Hallelujah. Amen. So, blessings be upon this ministry. My soul rejoices. When I got up this morning and I looked out and I saw the rains and I said, thank you, Lord, thank you. for sending the blessings, because we're looking for the latter rains. Ooh, the latter rains, hallelujah. Amen. The latter rains. Hashem has much to say about the latter rains. Mm -hmm. Much to say about Israel's future. And as we look at an Israel today, and all that is taking place in our world, how many of us know that we can rejoice and be exceedingly glad because we know that what God does, it's forever. From everlasting to everlasting, our God, He works His eternal purposes. And I am so grateful, as we are all grateful, that in God's prophetic timeline, there is a future and there is a hope for the children of Israel. And man, Israel, we celebrate this hope because we're looking for the coming of Moshiach. We're looking for the Redeemer to come and usher in this time of peace that we know we shall enjoy. For how many years, Rochelle, shall we enjoy that peace? <laughs> peace on earth. Millennial. Well, we hear about the millennium. That there's a thousand years that earth has its rest. But at the end of those thousand years, well... There has to be another assault. I thought we were done with war. So after a thousand years of peace, we will have a war that breaks out. And I, be, I guess this is the war to end all wars. Wars and rumors of wars. Yes. <laughs> it is the war to end all wars. And that war will be fought. And we are assured that the Lord will be victorious over the Satan, who... I don't want to go into detail on that one, but... If there is an adversary, which we know there is an adversary, because he'll try everything to disrupt the progress of the work of God, mm -hmm. even by putting commercials and interrupting our Shabbat, but we continue on. And for those that, that uh, stayed home, enjoy your, your comfort. For those that went on the road and gathered together this morning at the Jesse House, I want to commend each and every one because I am so grateful for this ministry. Because we have been so abundantly blessed with a great group of people. And we want to celebrate that. We want to celebrate this joyful ministry that God has given us and through all these years we have, as Israel will have, a remnant. And it is a faithful remnant. And that is the remnant that we are, we are today. So may we rejoice and be glad. May we rejoice and shout for joy 
that it's good to worship the Lord. And it is good to serve Him. And it is good to be His chosen people. Because God from all eternity knows His works. And what He is doing, has done, will do, is from everlasting to everlasting. And so, he who began the good work in a man Israel is faithful to finish it. And that's what gives me hope every day. Amen. That God who ordained this ministry for such a time as this, and that's a, from last term, right? Um, what is God doing? And how are we going to discern the times? I think about the apostles they had the opportunity to spend 40 days with Yeshua after his resurrection. And with many infallible proofs, what did, what did the Lord do? He gave them commandments. He gave them commandments through the Holy Spirit. Well, I thought we were done with commandments. No. God commands us for our own good. And we are grateful. For the commandments of God. We rejoice in His commandments. Because you see. When you have the Ruach HaKodesh. When you have the Holy Spirit in you. The Holy Spirit stirs in your heart. A desire to want to please God. Mm -hmm. A desire to want to fulfill. What God has called us to do. And we all have a ministry to fulfill. And there is a royal priesthood. That God has raised up. And this priesthood didn't just start yesterday. And so, in my last message was, what is God doing with this priesthood? What's He going to do with the priesthood that was Israel's priesthood? Remember, they had a priesthood. There was a tribe of Levite. And I believe Moshe was of that tribe. And he had a brother by the name of Aaron. And Aaron had sons. And they were to be priests to God for a specific number of years until they would be replaced by a new priesthood. So the question remains, Lord, what will happen to that priesthood you said will be a perpetual priesthood? Forever. See, I'm more concerned with what God does forever. Because you see, we're looking forward to forever with the Lord. And this work that He begins in us, He's faithful to finish it. And what's He going to do with it once it's finished? You see? What's He going to do with the church when He's finished with the church on earth? And then He takes the church out of the earth... What is he going to leave behind? Is he going to leave Israel no. without a priesthood? That's the question we're asking this morning. What, what about this priesthood that we read about? What about the forever that Hashem said would be that priesthood? Inquiring minds want to know because we who are of the body of Christ, the church, the pillar of truth on earth. We're looking forward to the coming tribulation because we know that gets us closer and closer to that time of peace. But not everybody's looking for the tribulation. They're looking to be raptured before that terrible time of Jacob's trouble. But Emmanuel Israel, you are a special group of soldiers. For such a time as this. That's probably why we don't have a lot of people after 10 years. Pastor Gill, you keep emphasizing we're going to go into the tribulation. <laughs> well, we don't want to be part of that tribulation. Therefore, no. we'll stay in our safe. <laughs> we'll stay on this side of the Jordan. We don't want to go over there. But for the faithful that make up this ministry. 
I thank God every day for you. Pray for you day and night. Because you see, you are precious to this ministry. Every single member of this, of Emmanuel. And so we want the opportunity to celebrate this ministry. And so next week, we will gather in my home in Yucaipa, and we will have a celebration. And bring your appetites, because there will be plenty to eat. And I plan to have a special guest speaker, because, well, you get Rochelle and I throughout the year. But there will be somebody there who was part of this journey years before. And as you know, we have branched out. We have planted churches. And Emmanuel Israel was one church plant that was unique among the other ones. The other ones were the regular church plants. Uh, I've been a missionary since 1983 and have planted multiple churches and have been involved in various ministries. But there was a time that God put a burden on the heart for Israel and the Jewish people, and that began the beginning of a journey that continues to this very day. And when God calls you to Jewish missionary work, you don't have to sit there and try to figure, is the Lord calling me? <clears throat> well, you have to remember that Isaiah 6 and verse 8 says what? That's for you, Rochelle. How do we respond to the call? I think that's where he said, woe is me if I unclean lips. Well, what does it say? Willing vessels. No, oh, I have a little. Yeah. Yes, you are. Whom shall I send? Whom shall I send? Who shall I send? Who is going to take this gospel to Israel and to the Jewish people in those difficult times. It's going to take those who have the courage and have the chutzpah to want to go against the grain of everyone else that doesn't want to go. Whom shall I send? Of whom does the Lord speak? He's looking for those volunteers that want to go where no one else wants to go. That's what makes this ministry unique among all ministries because not everybody is called to go to the Jewish people. As you can see, the world doesn't stand with Israel. They don't stand with the Jewish people. But will God forget Israel even in difficult times? Or has it been prophesied that our God is faithful and what He begins, He will finish and all of Israel will be saved? Because in the end, all that matters is, is Israel is saved. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Pray for the salvation of the Jewish people. What more can we say to that? Oh, I would love to see Hundreds of thousands of churches opening their, their doors to Jewish missionaries and inviting the Jewish people to come and let us worship and let us serve God together. The scripture says that in the latter days, ten Gentiles from the nations will, will latter to one Jew and says, let us go up to Jerusalem with you because we have heard that God is with you. Emmanuel Israel, God is with you. God will never abandon Israel. God will never vote against Israel like what just happened in the United Nations. This country turned its back on Israel at a time when Israel needed a friend. But I have good news. Israel, you have a friend in your Messiah. His name is Yeshua. And he never lives to make intercession for you. And so you see what Yeshua seeks is like-minded people who have a heart and a passion for his people, Israel, 
Because when Jesus came, he had a heart and a passion for his people Israel. Out of his own words, he says, I have come to seek the lost sheep of the house of Pharaoh to gather the Egyptians out of all the nations and bring them back to their land and restore all that was lost because of Pharaoh's pride. We saw what happened to Pharaoh's armies <clears throat> when the armies of the nations of the world will rise up in arrogance to destroy the Hebrew people. There is God in heaven who is the God of the Hebrews, who is the God of Israel, and the God of Israel will never, ever, ever turn his back on Israel. Israel doesn't need America's military might. Israel needs God's warriors. Whom shall we send? And a man of Israel, like Isaiah, raises their hand and says, And what are those words? And then, what does that mean? Send me. <coughs> Send me. Send me. Send me. If they won't go to the Jewish people, well, send me. I'll go to the Jewish people. Now, it's not going to mean you're going to have multitudes of people because we don't reach the Jewish people like that. Jewish missionary work is one-on-one. -on -one. And sometimes it takes years for one soul to come to faith in Yeshua. So we don't shy away from our mission. Our mission is the salvation of the Jewish people. If that makes us evangelical, so be it. But we never forget our mission. And no matter what the circumstances, we go. Because you see, Messiah is coming. And he will prepare the way before his coming. Right? And so, in our last message, which this is the second part, we go back to Malachi chapter 3. And again, we want to rehash what we had already declared that before that terrible day of the Lord, we know that day is coming. We see it on the horizon, right? The signs are there. Everybody's looking for this total eclipse of the sun. Yes. Some are saying it's a sign. Others are just, well, it's just a phenomenon. Open your eyes and see that we're seeing and witnessing extraordinary things happening in our world today. How much longer can this go on, Lord? How much longer? When is this all going to be done? When are you going to give Israel rest? And like the apostles, before the ascension of our Lord, will you now restore the kingdom to Israel? Will the kingdom be restored to Israel? Amen. Will David cease to have a man sit on the throne? If there is a kingdom, there is a king. And the king is of the seed of David. Might I remind you that he made us a kingdom of priests to his God. Will the kingdom have a priesthood? And will that priesthood be royal? Thank God for the church. Because that's the priesthood that's wrong. It's not with the Jewish people, it's with the church. That's what we've been told. So the question is, Lord, what about that priesthood that we read about? What about that priesthood that you said is an everlasting priesthood? What about the sons of Aaron? What about the offerings 
that are to be perpetual. <laughs> done by the church or done by that priesthood that we read about in the Holy Scriptures. But as it is, there is corruption. As long as we have humanity in our fallen state, are we subject to corruption? Thank God there are no corrupt pastors in the churches. Thank God that they all look out for the interest of Jesus Christ and not for their selfish ambitions. Thank God that we don't have celebrity preachers that seem to be building their empires. Thank God that we don't have dishonest Christians. If you want to read about unfaithfulness and idolatry and all the wicked things that God's holy people can do, then study Israel's history. Because it is a history of idolatry and unfaithfulness. But I hear the words of that great Jewish missionary by the name of Shaul of Tarsus, who said this, If we are faithless, he remains faithful. See, he cannot deny himself. So what God promised, what God has ordained from eternity, will be fulfilled. Because every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God, it will be fulfilled. Fulfilled. God's word will never return to him void. And so in Malachi chapter 3, what do we read? What do we read? And I'm going to have a hard time reading because I don't have my glasses. Uh, that would help. See, when you get to be my age, you have to magnify things a little bit. What is it about our eyesight? I thought I would be able to see without them. <laughs> Malachi chapter 3 verse 1 says once again behold I send my messenger see God is in the business of sending and like Isaiah who said send me that's the heart of a missionary are the missionaries the messengers Rochelle do they have a message yes. when they're sent and wherever you send me I will go and whatever you command me I will speak mm -hmm. so missionaries are to speak what they have been given to say we don't go with our own message no. if you are the messenger being sent you have a message that has been given to you by God mm -hmm. and you speak the words that God gave you to speak and you don't go beyond those words. Jesus said, the words that I speak to you, they are spirit, they are life. As I hear, so I speak. That means that as messengers, as missionaries, we must always be tuned into the spirit of God because the spirit of this age is all connected via the internet. <laughs> and they get their their intel from an artificial source that we don't know what demonic forces are behind that artificial intelligence, but the science that, that, that man relies upon is deceitful. It has its root back in that tree that God said you shall not eat from it. That tree of knowledge, that science tree, that one that, that set man on a course to become God. Pharaoh thought he was God on earth. Mm -hmm. There's only one God. And there's only one mediator between God and man. And what is his name? Yeshua. That doesn't change. It was true then and it is true now. Mm -hmm. And the word which we have received wasn't received through angels. It came from who? Jehovah himself. But he says, well, wait a minute, wasn't Jesus baptized by the messenger, John the Baptist? Wasn't he baptized in the river Jordan? And didn't he come up out of the water? Like every good Christian, when they, they 
are baptized? And didn't we read about the Holy Spirit descending upon him? Did we not hear the testimony of the Father who said, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased? And what are we supposed to believe? That the Holy Spirit was doing the work? Or was it Jesus the man doing the work? Good question. If it took the Holy Spirit for Jesus to fulfill his mission on earth, what makes it think that we can do it without the Holy Spirit? See, we can't rely on ourselves. We are not to rely on human wisdom or artificial intelligence to do the work of the Lord. There's only one, and that is the Holy Spirit. And in those 40 days that Jesus was, was commanding his disciples, he gave them this command. Terry, where? At Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Until you are endued with power from on high. Because the promise of the Father is the promise of the Holy Spirit. So what will happen when God pours out his Spirit upon Israel? What's going to happen to the Jewish people when they get filled with the Holy Spirit? What's going to happen when their sons and their daughters prophesy and all that was promised in the Holy Prophets, all that God said would be in the latter days when the latter rains would be part of What's going to happen? The United Nations is going to be turned upside down when the power of God comes upon Israel. Yes. Behold, I send my messenger. And what's the messenger going to do? He's going to prepare the way. So, we've already established that we can't do anything without the Holy Spirit. And he will prepare the way before me. Is the Lord speaking of a, a man? Or is he speaking about the Holy Spirit? Who is the messenger? You see, the apostles who Yeshua chose would be sent to carry out that great commission. But why did they have to wait before they would go for the Holy Spirit to come? That should tell you that without the Holy Spirit, you could be like Shaul, the first king of Israel, and fall flat on your face when the Holy Spirit departs from you. You see, what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And you see, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit, Godhead, you and I must remember that we're just lowly what? Humanity doesn't have it. Human reasoning, human wisdom, where does that get us? Into deeper what? Trouble. What we read in the Holy Scriptures is that the Holy Spirit is what made Moshe who Moshe had become. And the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit would come upon individuals in those ancient times, well, like Shaul, they were turned into another person. And under the influence of the Holy Spirit, the extraordinary happens. You become like Samson. See, the secret to the power of carrying out the message, of being the messengers, the missionaries that are going to go out, is the Holy Spirit. But we know from the Holy Scriptures that not everybody has the Spirit. Matter of fact, it's like those 12 that, that Paul asked, uh, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you first believed? 
And their response was, well, we haven't even heard that there was a Holy Spirit. How can you be a follower of Jesus and not even know that the Holy Spirit is there? Well, then what baptism did you receive when you were baptized? And the response was, well, we, it was John's baptism. And what is John's baptism? It is the baptism of repentance. Because you see, the gospel calls us to repentance. And you see, Israel needs repentance. And what happens when Israel repents? The promise of the Father will come upon them. You know what that is? The Holy Spirit. If Israel had the Holy Spirit today, Israel wouldn't be in the quagmire that it's in. So when the Holy Spirit comes upon you and the Holy Spirit comes upon me and we are transformed into someone else by the power of God. You remember Shaul was breathing threats against the church. He was going to destroy the church. But when the Holy Spirit came upon him, he was a fire preacher. That's the only way you're going to carry out your mission is by being filled with that Holy Spirit. If you don't, then you're going to try to do it in your own humanity. And I can assure you, you'll fall flat on your face. Because you see, man, like Napoleon, will ride his high horse thinking he can defeat the devil. I've got news for you. Man will never defeat the devil apart from God. The devil's more cunning than we are. He's been at it for a lot longer than we have. And see, he's got the whole world under his sway. You have to be 100% idiot to embrace a doctrine of replacement theology. You have to be 100% fool to think that God in some way or somehow is going to go against his chosen people. Somehow forsake them, turn around, and do what? <clears throat> Make a new people. Remember when he offered that to Moshe? And Moshe in his humility rather than, all oh, right, good, we can replace those, those, those Jews out there. We need more humble preachers like Moshe that will intercede for Israel than to gloat that we have replaced Israel. That comes from a place of what's called pride. And you know what goes before a fall is pride. Pride. So, what are we reading here in the messenger? You see, I will send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will suddenly come to his temple. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> what happens when the, when the Lord suddenly comes? What happened on the day of, what happened on that day when they were gathered together, the believers in Yeshua after he had ascended, and they, they were obedient to do what the Lord said do, and that was to tarry. But what do we do while we wait? They were praying. And as they were praying, what happened? The winds began to blow. And something phenomenal happened that day. They were transformed. All of a sudden, they were speaking in languages they never studied. And they were prophesying words that they had never gone to seminary to learn. So what were they speaking? They were speaking by the Holy Spirit. And you see, when you speak by the Holy Spirit, even the wisest theologians are confounded. Why? Because your human philosophy will never, ever get you to that place of holiness and that place of spiritual things that can only be discerned by the Holy Spirit. So the question is, who is the messenger? Is it a human being, a super powerful human being? Who is the one that's going to do 
what God said this messenger will do. And you see what the messenger will do? For the messenger, even the messenger of the covenant, in whom you, you delight, behold, he is coming, says the Lord of hosts. Who is this messenger of the covenant? Who is this one that when he comes upon you, you're given a mind and wisdom in that very hour that will turn the most educated minds up side down. Who is the messenger? And you see this messenger, but who can endure the day of his coming? Who? And who can stand where he appears? Because when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, you're overwhelmed by the power of God. You see, Jesus commanded his Talmudim to wait for the promise of the Father. Because if you're going to try to do this in your own human effort, you are going to go down in defeat. You'll be like Napoleon and you'll have your Waterloo Day. And then what's left is to go off into exile. A defeated warrior. If we think that we can do it without the Holy Spirit, then we're the fools. And we're the idiots. The whole world is filled with the spirit of Antichrist. But the Holy Spirit, well, that's the spirit of truth who will guide us into all truth. So, who is the messenger? Who will suddenly appear? Who will be able to stand when he does? Hey. can confound the Holy Spirit. You can't. Why? Because in a word, who is the Holy Spirit, Rochelle? God himself. And isn't it the Holy Spirit in you that gives you the power to become the missionaries that God has called you to be? So that like a like Isaiah, here I am, send me. Send me. Lord will never send you without the power to accomplish the mission that he has ordained. And the scripture goes on to say this. For he is like a refiner's fire. Jesus said, see, John even said, I baptize with water, but one who comes after me, whose sandals I am not even worthy to untie, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit, with the fire. The Holy Spirit and fire. For he is like a refiner's fire, and like a launderer's soap. He will sit as a purifier of silver. He will purify the sons of Levi. <coughs> Who is the messenger that has the power to refine the sons and to purify the sons of Levi? The Holy Spirit is the fire. The Holy Spirit is the fire. The Holy Spirit is not some theologian in a cemetery somewhere teaching those future preachers to hate Israel. Convincing them, persuading them that 
The church has replaced Israel. Replacement theology is the doctrines of demons. And I'm not ashamed to stand here and tell you, don't be swayed by that lie. How did that enter the churches? In the same way. That wolves come and sheep clothes. But you see, the Holy Spirit is the spirit of truth. And when you have the Holy Spirit in you, and the Holy Spirit is giving you that wisdom, giving you that discernment, rest assured that false, the counterfeit, the Holy Spirit will bring it to your knowledge to discern it. And so you see, who is the messenger that has the power to refine the sons of Levi. And why do they need refining if they've been replaced? Hmm? And so, and they, that they may offer to the Lord an offering in righteousness. Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be to the Lord. Will be what? Will be pleasant to the Lord as in the days of old, as in former years. The priesthood has a perpetual offering to offer up before the Lord. And so, we go to this week's partial, and we find that in Leviticus, and we read about the Levitical priesthood and their perpetual offering that is supposed to be forever. It's the law of the grain offering. And the law of the offering. And so I'm going to be in Leviticus and again. Chapter 6. And I want to read verse 18. This is the law of the grain offering. The sons of Aaron shall offer it on the altar before me, before the Lord. He shall take from it. He shall take what? A handful? A handful of what? A what? Flour. He shall take a handful of flour. And what is he going to do with this handful of flour? What's he going to do with the handful of flour? A fine flour, okay, of the grain offering with its oil and all the frankincense which is on, on the grain offering and shall burn it on the altar for a sweet aroma as a memorial to the Lord. And the remainder of it, Aaron and his son shall eat with unleavened bread. It shall be <clears throat> eaten in a holy place in the court of the tabernacle of meeting. They shall eat it. It shall not be baked with leaven. I have given it as their portion of my offerings made by fire it is most holy like the sin offering and the trespass offering <clears throat> now how long will this be how long how long we have to hear you forever, forever. What we just read in Malachi speaks of forever. This 
priesthood that is to offer this forever, if they have been ceased to exist and been replaced by the church priesthood, then guess what? The replacement theologists are right. But how do you reconcile these words with that doctrine? You don't. But something has to happen in order for this offering to be what? Pleasing to God again. Because you see, no offering is pleasing to God when it comes from the hands of a corrupt priesthood. And that is not just exclusive to the Jewish people, but when you have corrupt Christian leaders that are doing this, oh, what part of that is pleasing to the Lord? And if God would so rebuke and chastise this priesthood of Israel, what makes you think He won't do that to the church? If He didn't spare the natural branches, be careful. Lest He doesn't spare you either. See, there's always going to be a warning against pride and arrogance, especially spiritual pride and arrogance when we think we have it and the Jews lost it. No, the Jews haven't lost anything. And may I remind the church that this partial hardening of the Jewish people was for the benefit of the Jewish, of the Gentile world until the number of the Gentiles come in and then all of Israel will be saved because what God begins, He's faithful to finish it. And so what we read in this week's portion is an everlasting offering that is well pleasing to God. So we see a connection with the work of the messenger that will purify the sons of Levi so that the offering will be pleasing to the Lord. That speaks of restoration. You see, with repentance comes restoration, and that restoration brings times of refreshing from the presence of the Lord, hallelujah, leading to that final redemption that we're all looking forward to, that age of Messiah. But until that time comes, there's work to be done. The question is, who are the missionaries that are going to say, send me? Because you go filled with the Holy Spirit. I wonder if that makes you the messenger. Because if you've got the Holy Spirit in you, are you not His messengers? So, Scripture goes on to say this. I think a light would help, like a little light, but right now, here, give me a light, because I really am having a hard time seeing these words. And in verse 18, which is the key verse, all the males among the children of Aaron may eat it, <coughs> It shall be a statute forever in your generations concerning the offerings made by fire to the Lord. Everyone who touches them must be holy. So it means there's only one who can perfect holiness in you, and that is the Spirit of God in you. The Spirit of holiness. How can we perfect ourselves? If that's possible, then guess what? That self-righteous tradition of religion has the power to perfect you. Then you don't need Jesus and you don't need the Holy Spirit. You can do it on your own. Didn't the law prove to us something? That the righteous standard of God cannot be ever attained by a fallen creature? You need the Holy Spirit. You need the power of God. Jesus told His disciples to wait until they are endued with power. Wait for the promise of the Father. Well, when you study the promise of the Father, the promise of the Father was to the children of Israel that in the latter days, they would be filled with the Holy Spirit and they would prophesy. They would be the messengers. They would be the ones going forth. Call 
calling Israel to repentance worldwide. Why? Because where are the children of Levi today? Where are the sons of Aaron today? Well, they ceased to exist a long time ago. <clears throat> May I remind you, the Kohanim still exist. So they need refining. They need purifying. And the fire of the Holy Spirit is the one who does the work of refining and perfecting and purifying and making holy everyone who touches them must be holy. For this offering to be everlasting, and there has to be an everlasting priesthood to offer it. And that priesthood is referring to that tribe among the twelve of Israel. Well, something tells me God's not done with Israel. And the Lord spoke to Moses saying, This is the offering of Aaron and his sons, which they shall offer to the Lord, beginning on the day when he is anointed, one-tenth of an ephah of fine flour as a daily grain offering, half of it in the morning and half of it at night. He shall make and shall be made in a pan with oil. When it is mixed, you shall bring it in. The baked pieces of the grain offering you shall offer for a sweet aroma to the Lord. The priest from among his sons who is anointed in his place shall offer it. It is a statute forever to the Lord. Forever to the Lord. Forever means forever. Because if this forever doesn't mean forever, then your everlasting life is not forever. Sorry. Okay, so understand who is the messenger? Who has the power to refine the sons of Levi? If not, the power of God, the Spirit of God. And how does the Spirit of God move in our midst? Through those chosen vessels. So here's the question. Who are the messengers? Who are the ambassadors? Who are the ones who have the ministry of reconciliation calling the children of Israel to repentance and be reconciled to their God? For this to be fulfilled, there has to be a purifying. Because if the priesthood is corrupt, then it is not holy. It is profane. And we only know from history what God does with profane offerings. And a profane offering is simply this. When you and I offer to the Lord something that is profane which includes ourselves. The only thing I know that can profane the holiness in us is this filthiness called sin. sin yes. Why is it unleavened? What does the leaven represent? Sin. sin. When sin enters the life of any child of God, you are profaned. Mm -hmm. eh? mm -hmm. And how can you be pleasing to God when you are profaned? It must be, whoever touches this must be holy. This is an everlasting, forever offering. It's a statue. Okay? It is forever. Now I want to close this going back to Malachi because it's very important that we make this connection. You see. 
In chapter 3 of Malachi, we read once again, you see, in verse 4 it says, Then the offering of Judah and Jerusalem will be pleasant to the Lord, as in the days of old. So God's not done yet. He will fulfill it. And the messenger will come, and the sons of Levi will be purified. They will be made holy. As in former years, and I will come near you for judgment. Because you see, God is still a God of what? Justice. And he comes to execute justice, judgment, righteousness on the earth. Well, what does that say about you and me and us? What will we say when we stand before him that, well, I didn't want to go. The cost was too much. Well, it wasn't popular to go after those people. So I, I just wanted to make sure that I, I stuck around the crowds. Was that Isaiah's heart? And that certainly is not the heart of a missionary especially the heart of the Israel, Emmanuel, Israel missionary. See, get a hold of this truth. The missionaries that will be sent out are messengers, and they have a mission to fulfill. There is a focus, and that focus is on Israel and the children of Israel scattered among nations. Wherever the Spirit of God leads you, there you go. Wherever you send me, I will go. And whatever you command me, that I will speak. Because it's not you speaking, it's the Holy Spirit in you doing the work. And is God able to produce the fruit when the Holy Spirit is doing it? So I say this to anybody who has this tugging in their heart for Jewish missionary work. Don't sit there to try to figure out how you're going to do it. Don't do that. That comes from pride. That comes from a place where I gotta, I gotta figure out because you see, God needs my help to figure it out. Hmm? Good Lord, we have two thousand years of church history, and the Jews still need saving. So it's gonna take God stepping in to do it because the church is not fulfilling it. So there's only one that's gonna fulfill the great commission to that nation, which most churches won't go, and that's. The Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And I don't see the Holy Spirit leaving in the rapture. Because you see, if he leaves, then that leaves man to have to fend for himself. Then we'll all be like Shaul, the first king of Israel. Pretty messed up. <laughs> so here, once again, I will come near you for judgment. I will be a swift witness against sorcerers, against idolaters, against perjurers, and against those who exploit wage earners and widows and orphans and against those who turn an alien away. Because they do not fear me, says the Lord of hosts. For I am the Lord. I do not change. Therefore you are not consumed, O sons of Jacob. Who are the sons of Jacob? If are they not the ones who have been promised by God, that the Holy Spirit will be poured out on them. And these sons and daughters of Jacob will prophesy. I don't know about you, but prophesying includes going out there and speaking the words that are given to you by the Holy Spirit. And in those prophesies, you're speaking encouragement and you're speaking comfort to the people that need to be encouraged and need to be comforted, especially in times such as this, when the whole world is condemning Israel, thank God for those faithful messengers that bring good tidings to the people of Israel. That your Messiah has not forsaken you. And we are his ambassadors that have been sent to you not with a message to condemn you and to threaten you that we will abandon you. No. But to rejoice with you 
because you are God's chosen people. And your priesthood will be refined. The Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, will be the one perfecting holiness in that royal priesthood. And the offering will once again be pleasing to the Lord as it was in days of old. And so, yet from the days of your fathers you have gone away from my ordinances and have not kept them. And so here's the call to Israel. Return to me. Return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you said, in what way shall we return? It's amazing. Because I hear replacement theology preachers preach these words to invoke fear in the Christians that they bring their tithes and offerings in. But these words were spoken to who? To Israel. So the question is, in what way shall we return? Well, here's the question. Will a man rob God? This is a very Jewish thing. You ask, answer a question with another question. And yet another question. And round and round we go with more and more questions. Sounds like Rochelle and I when we midrush. We just never get to the point. We just have more questions. Right? But you say, in what way have we robbed you? <clears throat> in tithes and offerings. Uh-oh. In tithes and offerings. You are cursed with a curse, for you have robbed me, even the whole nation. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And try me now in this, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open for you the windows of heaven and pour out for you such blessing that there will not be room enough to receive it. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake so that he will not destroy the fruit of your ground, nor shall the vine fail to bear fruit for you in the field, says the Lord of hosts. And the result? And the nations will call you blessed, for you will be a delightful land, says the Lord of hosts. Delightful land. Delightful land. Well, might I remind you? Might I remind you that if we take these words and just bring them down to the level of gold and silver, money, then we're missing the whole point. Remember? They shall be holy. The sons of Levi shall be holy. Might I remind you that the firstborn among the sons of Israel are holy to God. They are what? Like a tithe. Bring them into the storehouse. Why? Because you see, those are the ones that God will send out as messengers to gather the flocks of Israel in the latter days. See, people miss that. Because you see, when you're focused on money, then you're going to use this to get money. But this is speaking of what? So you see, when one who is holy to God profanes himself and does other things with his life other than serving God, that's the profanity that came into that priesthood to corrupt it. So they became those perjurers. They became those adulterers. They became those idolaters. They were corrupt. That's what happens when you take what is holy to God and profane it. The Sabbath is holy to God, but man can profane it by just refusing to observe it. And in the same way, <clears throat> those firstborn of the sons of Israel are to be holy to God. And in that holiness, they are to serve God. And so you see, we who are the first fruits having the first fruits of the Spirit of God, are we not holiness to God? And isn't the holiness of God supposed to go to the children of Israel, taking the gospel in the fullness of the power of the Holy Spirit? Well, that's how it began in the first century of the church. 
until Rome corrupted it and made it profane. But God is not done with Israel. And God is not done with sending messengers to the children of Israel. Amen, Israel. Let us be those messengers. Taking the Holy Spirit. Eh. Because you see, when you have the Holy Spirit, wherever you go, the fire of God is there. See, the whole, see, the devil fears the Holy Spirit. Because when the Holy Spirit is in the house, the demons flee. When your house is filled with philosophers and theologians that are just, you know, philosophy trained, they're good speech makers. But like Paul said, where's the, where, where, where's, where's the power? The kingdom of God is not fancy speeches, it's not rhetoric, it is power. It is the power of the Holy Spirit. And when the Holy Spirit is moving, when the Holy Spirit is operating, you got the power. You got the power. And it's only the power of the Holy Spirit that will purify the sons of Levi to fulfill what God said would be a forever statue. And once again, the offering will be holy and pleasing to God. Amen? Mm -hmm.